friend, how you doing? How y'all doing? So uh, today, um, I am going to just kind of refine this painting because I got a person from Facebook that asked me, that commissioned me, actually, to do a painting. You know, basically, she's going to be in the Garden of Eden. And uh, so that should be pretty good. That should be pretty good. And uh, nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, uh, anyway, there's no answer for the live guest. So that didn't happen. But it seemed like I froze a little bit. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> anyway, I unfroze. So <laughs> that's all good. That's all good. So uh, essentially, what I'm going to do is paint this painting right back now. Oops. Let me not put my head in the way because I'm messing with my exposure. So uh, I'm going to paint in there. I'm gonna, you can see I started some grass. So I'm going to, the guy who's got shot or the arrows, well, let me move my chair out of the way. The guy who's gotten shot by the arrows is a little bit obscured by grass. And that's kind of my little thing where like my head's in the way. It's like the person, the viewer, is going to have to look to the side or look between the grass see what's going on. Oops, what am I doing with this exposure thing with this out there? So, Thomas Sullivan, do your thing, brother. Yes, sir, bro. <laughs> you know that, you know? That's what I do. That's what I do now, you know? I mean, I've done other things, but this is what I do, man. So, um, yes, I'm going to do my thing. And so, essentially, what I'm going to do is finish I like this kind of design that I have him with some grass kind of obscuring him. At first he's kind of dark and he's dead. I didn't really paint his face the best that I could have painted it because I kind of had an idea that I would have grass obscuring him. So I'm going to work on that some more, kind of bush that up. You see I don't have the grass growing all the way down. I'm kind of looking at the way the light and the shadows is going to reflect in there. And then over this side, I'm just going to, I'm, in here I'm going to add some smoke. You can work on it. And then also my clouds. My sun needs to hit some of these more purplish clouds up here. Then over here, I want this to get dark as it gets this way a little bit more. A little bit more. Of course, it's a sign here that's going to say Jamestown. I probably won't do that today, but I might. And then, of course, these rocks here. I'm going to refine that so that looks a little bit nicer. Smoke in here from that boom. The colonials with the old muskets, the long guns. The smoke goes up. I have some smoke here, but I'm going to put some more. It's gonna just, I'm basically doing that as a convention to help my foreground images pop out a little bit more, come forward, and I'll help them come forward or recess, you know? So that's kind of what I'm doing right now at the moment in this painting today in this session. And of course, I got so many obstacles in my studio, you know, it looks spacious, but I'm really matching out this space, so I got junk. I got stuff everywhere. I need a I need a bigger studio. I need some people to buy my paintings in the coronavirus, of course. If they, if they can't do shows, I can, but who wants to come to an art show and get coronavirus, you know? <laughs> you know, see some paintings and catch the virus, you know. And I don't wanna be I don't wanna be the guy that, you know, oh they came to your art show and such and so got sick, you know. That's just not gonna be cool. So <clears throat> In other words, and I uh, got a little bit of uh, a little bit. Of, oh, there we go. I got a little monitor so I can halfway see myself. So, anyway, without too much more, you know, chit chat for me. I'm gonna get the painting. But if anybody have any questions, like yesterday, what I did was I did a little class on. Let me see if I can adjust this uh, exposure. This thing keeps changing. I got this little lens thing to help me so I can get a wider view. Tell me which one is better for you guys. Is this better? You, you see less in my room, but you see a closer shot of the painting. Is that sharper and better? Uh oh, no, I don't want that. And if you tap on this thing too much, it'll flip. Is that better? Or is. So I got this little lensy thing for my iPad mini. That's what I'm using to do these lives. Or is this better? Where you can see more of my studio. Let me get the, uh, 
anyway, I think this one's better because you can see more in my studio. You can even see when I get tired and have to rest. <laughs> so there we go. So you can see more of my paintings there. I don't have my Tupac painting out. My Tupac and my Nipsey Hussle painting. You get that one going. Okay. get my Tupac and my Nipsey. I gotta have them out. It's not the same without them here. Without Tupac and Nipsey. It's got to have them. Let me open this up so we can see Tupac. You can't miss Tupac. These are the prophets of the revolution. Right, Chip? Okay, so, uh, and you gotta have your prophets of the revolution ever in front of you, so you can always stay focused on what the mission is. Okay, so, got my Tupac and Nipsey. I'm going to do some more. I think I might do one of Biggie. I'm definitely going to do uh, Raina as my art, too. However, uh, I'm waiting on somebody to help me out with that. So, Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I guess you guys can hear me. Nobody's complaining. Let me do I can figure out a way that I can test my audio. So let me try that out real quick. Let me try that bad boy out. And then we'll be right on. Okay, so yeah, yeah, y'all can hear me. So it's all good. It's all good. And what I'm going to do is also put my earbud on just in case we fall, the, the, the audio fall out. I will kind of know what's going on. Okay, let's see if I can get that going. There we go. Good to go now. I probably could have set that up for. Oh, you hear, hear me loud and clear. Thank you, uh, Isha. You're the most kind, the most wonderful. Well, everybody who comes to my room, I have to. I really uh, am, am blessed and fortunate to have some really good people, friends that I met on Facebook. You guys have definitely helped me with my painting. I probably need to do some kind of tribute painting for you guys. You know, my, my special picture. I might, I might have to do a tribute painting for my special people who helped me to, uh, I mean, you guys, it's, it's good to have people to talk to when you're painting. Sometimes you're in, a, in your studio, you're all by yourself. Nobody is calling you. <laughs> Nothing's happening, you're just painting. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this brush here, and I'm gonna use my stool. I think I might not even use my stool. I think I'll put my stool, I'm gonna have to sit down on my apple box. And I'm gonna work on some foliage over this side. I've already kind of started it a little bit and kind of see if I like it, and kind of see how I'm gonna play with the light. And I'm liking it. I'm liking it a lot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep on doing that because it's working. And you know, as an artist, when you get something that's working, just like anything else, when you get something that's working, you definitely want to kind of start exploring that. And then when I call it, I say you get a PhD in it, you know. When you're working a certain element of your painting, you want to, you want to master that. You want to learn in the process of painting that. You want to learn how do I paint this particular thing the best that I can possibly paint this thing. You know, I mean, I have this idea visually. So how do I get that idea to be maxed out to the, to the fullest, you know? And so what I'm doing is I'm envisioning these blades of grass here. And I'm using a number one a number one uh, synthetic bristle brush 
which is working out pretty good. This is a brush for by it's a company called um, Creative Mark, and uh, um, I get some supplies from Jerry Autorama. I think they have some of the best prices. So if you're interested in, in starting painting and you want to know where you can get some good supplies for the best price, and if you want to get kind of towards the professional supplies, they are a very, very good source. Uh, I would recommend them. And they're, they're not endorsing me for anything, but they're just, you know, I do observation. I just learned that that they, uh, you know, Blick is pretty good. Blick Art is pretty good too. And Cheap Joe's is pretty good. However, um, the, 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 they have free uh, video tutorials. I think if you're a beginner, and I'm, I'm addressing this to people that's be beginners, that they, they, they actually uh, will open up some of the product for people that's new with the product. You know, because some of these products are very expensive. You know, you might wind up spending $100, $200 to get a setup, you know, where you can actually use, and they would demonstrate it for you. And it's kind of like a, a little class and how to use some of these very expensive things. And I don't see any other stores. They have good prices. Other stores got good prices now. Uh, but Jerry, had, Jerry Autorama has good prices. In addition to that, I think they really do a good service to people who is kind of new, uh, where they kind of um, introduce you to some professional, professional uh, supplies and tools without, and, and if the videos allow you to kind of to kind of um, see if it's for you, you know, before you actually have to invest your money. So uh, that's why I, I, I actually like them because, you know, I'm thinking about other people. I mean, I kind of know what I want, you know, and I usually when, I, when I'm online, I don't even bother calling in or anything because I know exactly some of, this, some of the products I've been using, I've been using for a long time. But like um, like the PCB, uh, the, P, uh, the PBA uh, size, that's kind of new for me, actually. Uh, I haven't been using that for a long time because it's newer technology and um, it's not, you know, I always like to go with the traditional tried and proven, time tried and proven techniques, you know, but there's a lot of, you know, in almost every industry out there, there is innovations happening and new products, innovative products, that just makes life easier uh, or just work better, you know? And uh, so that's why I like uh, Jerry Autorama. They actually take the time to make these videos because you gotta pay somebody to do that. I mean, it costs money. It comes out of their bottom line. And, uh, and I think it's very gracious for them to do something like that, you know. Like I say, most people will have to go to art school and then you get a professor. And then a little bit at a time, this, your professor will kind of give you a, a hint here and there, a pointer here and there, and you take notes on it. You, you're like, oh my gosh, I just got a kernel of knowledge. And sometimes, uh, you know, you get good professors, they give you a lot of knowledge, but then people don't listen, you know. Uh, art school is kind of funny because you go to art school, and you it's like a traditional school, and I don't think art school should be like that, personally. Because you start generally in September 1, and then by December or the end of November, you have to, it's over. So how can you do a painting? If you guys have followed me on this painting here, even though I was off and on with this painting, I stopped the painting, I started. But a lot of times with paintings, you don't want to rush it. You rush a painting, you're going to destroy it. Now, as a student, you're not going to be, I would suggest never to take your paintings too preciously. Because when, you, when you're trying to paint too precious, you know, the painting is, every painting's got to be a masterpiece. You don't learn because what you do is you start getting choked up, you get anxious, and you start not liking the process of painting because sometimes your paintings don't become a masterpiece. You have to paint your way into you have to paint your way into a masterpiece. You don't, you don't just go out and just say, okay, this idea I came up with is going to be excellent. You know, because a, a lot of beginners, they do that. Oh, this is going to be great. Look, 
because they spent, you know, $50 or $25 on whatever, you know, they, they went to Michael's, you know, and that's a lot of money because they're used to spending money on bills. They're not used to spending money on art supplies because they're not a professional. And so they really think for this, this little $25 that I spent at Michael's, I want to make a masterpiece out of this. And then when they actually invest their time, which is more valuable actually than the $25 that they spent, they don't get a masterpiece, you know? And then they're a little upset either with themselves or they're upset with uh, the product. But what it is is that you're doing, you're, you have too high expectations. And we don't learn anything like that. You, as a child, you didn't learn to walk that way. It took you a couple of days, you know, a couple of months. You took a baby step, you know. And the same thing when you're learning to drive. They don't just put you out there and hand you the keys and say, okay, let me give you a couple of hours and put you on the freeway, you know. They, 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 they kind of ease you into that thing, you know? And that's how you do, that's how you get to the place where you're painting masterful paintings. I'm not saying everyone is a masterpiece, but when you get a lot of paintings that uh, almost every painting you do is on a masterful level. Now, some paintings look good to, 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 to the, the onlooker, but to me, as the painter, I, I, I know that I'm suffering with the painting. I know I'm struggling. But somebody else goes, oh my gosh, that is a good painting. But to me, it's not the best. Because in my mind's eye, the painting looks better. <laughs> but to a person that's looking on, you know, because I have X amount of experience, that looks better than the average. So they go, oh my gosh, that is really good. So. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> That's where that comes from. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of obscuring, <clears throat> I'm obscuring the, uh, the dead guy, you know? Making him a little bit more mysterious. You're still gonna be able to see him here, but he's, he, I don't want him to die in like, oh, he's dead as a colonial die. I don't want him to be celebrated as a good guy, because these guys were bad guys. These were invaders. These were mercenaries. And what they did was they came in and they took, they stole <laughs> uh, land, uh, killed people. They destroyed villages. I mean, it depends. Everything is about perspective, you know? So the perspective of this painting is not to necessarily glorify Jamestown. Uh, the natives did not like Captain John Smith like they have in a Disney film. He was literally killing them and killing their loved ones. I mean, who, who likes somebody who's killing your family? <laughs> I don't think most people like that. I mean, you got a home somewhere at a village uh, or a little township, and then somebody goes in and destroys your township. You know, he wasn't a nice guy. Cause that's basically what you destroy a village, you destroy a township. Cassandra Jordan, hey, how you doing? Look, the little thing said bring on camera. So you know what? I don't know if you put that up there or not, but if you want to join my camera, I'm gonna hit the button. I can do that. So if you ever want to do that, uh, I'll be more than happy to let somebody join in. <clears throat> Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna add a little bit more Viridian Green here because I need some darker greens because I wanna really kind of have shadowy greens. So I'm gonna be mixing these darker greens with a little cobalt blue and start creating some, some grass. But these grass, you can barely see this grass probably from the camera. You can barely see this color grass that I'm adding now against this black from this hat, from this, from the conquistador's hat. And he's in, the reason I painted it black is because he's in shadow. The conquistador is in shadow. And I'm gonna get another one of these uh, round brushes because they're really, really good. And it's doing a real good job for me, so. I'm gonna get this brush too. And I'm gonna try this brush. This brush is a little thicker. 
And I really wish I had some more of these. I'm gonna get a filbert too. I'm gonna put those on hold. And uh, usually I retire a brush when I add brushes because I don't want to clean up too much. Not that I'm lazy, but you know, I have to have good brush management, you know. Okay, so um, also I need to refer to my my image, and I have my image back here, so. I like to get the overall image because I have to get up and back up because a lot of times I'm close like that. I can't even really, you know, you're too close for comfort, you know. You really get a good idea of what's developing, you know. Because this image is so big, the image really hits you from about 15 feet away, you know. So when I'm sitting here like a foot or two away, it's, it's not the best. It's not the best because that's not where the, the that's not the key spot that the audience gonna be in. Now I'm using this bristle brush right here, and this is doing a pretty good job. It's not doing a bad job in here. And oh, I know what I, I had an idea and I lost it just that fast and I just got it back. And the idea is that I have I made some smoke in there, I kind of softened the edge of that that sombrero there. Well, not sombrero. <laughs> it's called, you know, they had them big conquistadors. Some of the guys were swordsmen and spearsmen. And some of the guys were, you know, you know, were musket men, you know. And, uh, and the musket men actually had a tendency to wear these very large brim hats because they didn't have sunglasses too much back then. So this is how you shaded your eyes so you can take aim and shoot. So they would wear somewhat these the brims. Oftentimes they would pin them up. When you see the colonial people, they have the, their brim pinned, pinned up. That's because you're catching them while they're not killing anybody. But when it's time for them to get down to business, that hat came down to shield their eyes, kind of like a cowboy sombrero. And, uh, and then they got busy to shoot them. So right now they're in a in 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 a, in a pitch of a battle right here. This guy right here is falling, and I do want to kind of sharpen this. That got a little too that got a little too uh, soft right there. With the smoke that I did in a previous paint session. Yeah, so. That's pretty good right there. I like that. So, okay. So this brush is doing pretty good. I'm gonna set that to the side, and uh, I think I'm gonna get. I'm gonna at least have four brushes on deck. Four brushes on deck when I'm doing this. Yeah, that's good. And these brushes are bigger, so they're more absorbent. So I'm going to be going through my medium a whole lot faster. Okay, and now I'm kind of getting a little bit of ultramarine, a little bit of cobalt, and a little bit of viridian green. Because sometimes with grass, it's the darker blades of grass that make the lighter blades look interesting. So if you don't put, if you just put all light blades in there, and you don't put dark blades in there. You don't get that nice grass look. So, and I also have some uh, emerald green in this, in this mix of grass as well. Because this is, you know, a lot of times when people are going to do battles, when, when, you know, they do it in actually good weather. <laughs> I mean, they don't want to be cold, they don't want to be hot. I mean, it's a physical thing. So this will be the spring of the summer here, but this battle has gone down. And what I'm doing is I'm using the tip of this brush. Now this brush right here is a round brush, but it's a number six of the, uh, these are called the, the pro, pro white brushes. That's what, that's, I think is the, is the, is the uh, it's a brush that, uh, that, uh, Jerry's Autorama mix has made and it's an alternative it's a very good brush 
and it's an alternative to the more expensive brushes and uh, you know and uh, of course I always like to buy the best brushes but uh, if if the if the uh, if the alternative brushes are just as good if not better then some of the um, the more name brand brushes why not just go ahead and why not just go ahead and get your uh, and just get and save some money you know so very good brush so so I'm trying to bush up the, the grass but I don't want to destroy the light and dark that I got working right here I really kind of like the way the composition works with the, the, the lightness of the blades of grass and the darkness of the individual behind the grades of grass. At the same time, I do want to paint very good, I want to paint very good blades of grass. I don't want to paint any not so good blades of grass. You know, my blades of grass must look good. And what I'm doing is I'm holding the brush a little bit more towards the end. That gives me more of a, um, I'm using more of the, uh, I guess, the right side of my brain, the creative side, as opposed to the more analytical side. When you're choking, you're really trying to control something. And when you're trying to control something, a different part of your brain starts firing off. So that's why you see a lot of painter's brushes, artist brushes, that are very long. Because they're, they're just kind of like uh, going off of memory. They painted so many paintings. They painted so many paintings that it's like walking. When you go out to run, you don't think, okay, I'm going to move left leg faster, right leg faster, okay, and I'm going to stretch out a little more. You don't really do that. You just start running faster. And likewise, uh, when you get to the right place as a painter, you don't think about, you don't think about, okay, I'm going to move this line this way and this line. You just go do it. And that, and when you're doing something like that, you're using a different portion of your brain. And you're allowing the part of your brain that is the more, I guess, spiritual side. That's why a lot of people do painting as kind of like a meditation or kind of like a, a leisure, a stress reliever. Because what they don't realize they're doing <laughs> Is they're using a different portion of their brain that they usually, and a lot of people who like to do that are CEOs and people with a lot of stress. And, and people that do a lot of very meticulous, exact things a lot. Uh, now, the problem is you have to get to that place. You have to get to that place where you're doing that. And a lot of beginners, they're thinking too much. So... <laughs> They're not really getting the full benefit, and that's why you have a certain instructor there, and those guys, what they're trying to do is loosen you up. They're trying to relax you. It's kind of like yoga. Uh, painting or art is much, people say, well, why don't you do yoga? I am doing yoga. <laughs> this is yoga. This is yoga. Um, this is a type of uh, meditation. This is a type of uh, this is a type of spirituality. Painting is a type of spirituality. Uh, not just the concept, you know, of the design that I have. That's a that's another type of spirituality. But just the the motions, the body motions of putting down images, a certain kind of line. For example, I'm gonna mix a tone as I'm mixing. I'm not thinking about the tone. I just, it looks right. And then when it looks right, I know it. And then what I do is I say, how do my line need to go? And I say, oh, I see the line right here. I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna do an SE, I'm gonna do an SE one. See, I just felt that and I did it. You see, one of the blades of grass is crimpled from the fall. See? So there we go. See, so now, so, oh, but it's not that one. He's lonely, crippled. There's another one that kind of went sideways, too. But this one kind of did this and went this way. See? 
and you're kind of having this dialogue with yourself, but at the time, same time while you're having this dialogue, this you something it's like something else is talking to you. When you get to a good place with your painting, you're talking to yourself, yes. But at the same time, it's like a, another person is talking. You almost have a companion with you. you. A lot of artists, they you say, well, they're kind of like lone wolves. They sit there all by themselves. Are they really by themselves? Has anybody asked themselves that? Artists, when they're in the studio, I'm talking about people who just do this every day, eight to 10 hours a day. Steve uh, Linton, what's up? How you doing, brother? Hey, you. let me see how I bring you on camera. Let's see if you're braver. <laughs> if you want to come on cam, you can. But uh, anyway, if you don't, I understand. But uh, you know, um, I'm just basically talking art philosophy. I mean, you got to go to art school to, 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 to get some of this input that I'm giving you. So if you're an artist, tune in, you know. Check it out, you know. Tune into my stuff because you're going to learn something about art because I don't mind teaching a person, but I don't want to teach a person, okay, this is how you paint, this is how you paint a grapefruit. This is how you paint an apple sitting on a, uh, you know, a still life, you know. <laughs> See, you're using, you're not using the right part of your brain. You're using, you're using the, the left part of your brain. Uh, now, there is times that you should be learning to do that, to get your academics together. Before you get those before you get those skills, you probably are going to be using, you know, the, the left part of your brain to kind of, and then you see I'm choking more in now because I kind of know what this line is gonna be. So now I'm doing a different kind of my brain to kind of meticulously get a nice sharp edge and get a nice line. So I bounce sometimes from the left to the right side of my brain a lot of artists, you notice that I'm left-handed. Now, Facebook has a tendency to flip around the image, but everything is mirror image, so whatever you're seeing there, flip it, because it's probably the opposite. I, I, maybe I figured that out. Let's see, if this thing, is this thing on the right side of the, how is my studio situated here? I don't know. This is my left, and this is my right. So I don't know if you're seeing that correctly or not. The thing said bring somebody on the camera, so I keep hitting the buttons, but don't nobody come in. So I gave you an invitation to come in and join me in my studio. And uh, hey, you know, it's just all about commune, man, being a commune. See, people don't commune as much anymore. Everybody's kind of in their own little space, in their own little world. I even see something on this painting now. See, just that quick. Here's something that I thought of a long time ago on this painting. I just saw something, and guess what? I'm gonna paint on this painting song. First of all, it's the same color. And that's the great thing about having multiple paintings in your studio like this. You know, I can just bounce. And I, I thought about doing that. You know, especially when I get to a certain level with all this painting, none of these paintings are finished. I just like to just go from painting to painting, but I said, well, that won't look good. That won't look good on Facebook because that would just confuse people. I'm, I, I work on one painting for one minute, <laughs> go over, bounce to another painting. So, uh, so what I'm trying to do now is I am not mixing as much medium in now, and see now I'm getting more. I'm choking in on the brush. And what I'm trying to do now is make these blades look pretty. And it's more of a technical thing. It's not the way the blade is gonna go. That was coming from my subconscious level. But now the way the blade is going to look pretty, that's coming very much from my technical conscious skill level. So it's a matter, it's, it's, it's learning how to bounce very fluidly between these uh, modal operandi. You know, you wanna, you wanna bounce between those modes. You're, never, you're not staying in one mode all the time, you're just using different modes. It's kinda like a, a race car driver. 
he's in he's in the second gear but then at a certain time and a certain curve or uh, when he's getting ready to pass or do something like that he switches gears he switches his modes you know and so what I'm doing now is trying to and I want a certain amount of thickness on these blades of grass. I want some impasto, in other words. If you don't know what these words are, just try your best. Just go to Google. Try your best to, uh, to to spell them. And Google does a pretty good job of getting you to the right definition. But impasto is the texture or the relief of the paint, whereas. Um, the paint has different um, thicknesses, and if you put, you can, you know, it's kind of like if you got some um, some butter. If you're making a cake, you know, it's kind of like making a cake, and you're spreading the icing on a cake. Sometimes you want a thin icing on a cake, and then other times you want a thick icing on a cake, and then when they start swirling a little like thickness, you know. They take that big spatula knife, and what they're doing is they're varying the thicknesses of the ice, the icing on the cake. So uh, I, that's impasto. That's impasto. That's impasto used on a cake. So when you use an impasto on a painting, when you use an impasto on a painting, what you're doing is. Um, varying the thickness of your paint. So what you do is you grab some paint and you load up a big thick water paint and you just go eh, and you lay it in there nice and thick. And again that's more of a that's more of a uh, left brain thing because that's more of a technique. But what I do is I do more right brain stuff when I initially put down the blade because when I do that, I can't, you know, I want the blade to go a certain way. And each one of these lines are kind of like going to intrigue someone's eye. So uh, some of it's automatic and some of it's very deliberate. All of it is designed to intrigue the viewer's eye into the paint. Okay, now I'm going to have to deal with the grass at the bottom, but for right now, I'm focusing on the grass at the top. So, yeah, that's pretty good. So I like that. And uh, of course, I want to push in some more of the grass on the very, very right side. And uh, then I'm going to go back. I don't really want to do too much wet on wet with this. But first, I think I'm going to go right alongside this and just create some more depth with these blades of grass. I'm using more ultramarine blue for this. I'm using not necessarily straight ultramarine blue because it's getting mixed with viridian. It's getting mixed with cobalt blue as well and viridian green. But I want uh, I want the I want the differences in tone of grass. I want it kind of intertwined. I want it randomized because grass is random. And basically, I just painted the way the light is the the chlorophyll or the the, the, re, the sun is. Re, dealing with the green in the grass. So now I'm dealing with the shadow side of the grass. Dealing with the shadow side of the grass now. And I, I have wet green, so I'm just almost using straight ultramarine blue. And what it's doing is it's mixing, it's mixing on the canvas with the, with the, uh, with the, uh, the emerald green and also there is a uh, lemon yellow uh, light, uh, cadmium yellow light 
uh, is with the uh, emerald green as well to kind of lighten it up some. Just to give it just that right tone and flavor. And just a touch of titanium white, just a touch is in there. And I'm just kind of breaking up, making it more grassy like. Of course, now what I'm really trying to focus on is making making these grass blades interesting. And I'm going to go back once this set up. Once this grass sets up, I'm going to go back again and paint wet on dry. Right now, I'm painting a technique called wet on wet with this. And finally, I'm going to go back on to the other side here. And I'm going to figure out exactly how to bush this up. I'm going back to the other side of my brain, you know, the more automatic side, the more spiritual side. The side where I have like a little bit more of a, a subconscious uh, or I guess it's a... Uh, you know, the pleasure lobe side or the, uh, the happiness side, you know? Because I want these blades, you know, you saw Bob Ross, he said, oh, the happy little, the happy little tree. And when he was saying that, he was literally accessing the left side of his brain. Because it's happy. See, he was enjoying that. That was some type of joy. You know, there was joy coming from that experience of him painting that so just to get another that's a topic I guess that for today is when you paint what side of the brain are you painting with you know and so I would tell and you know what I might do uh, I think Yvette Smith if you still here I might start doing some painting classes online so anybody interested, DM me, and we're going to start getting into that. I mean, if you guys want to learn how to paint, you want to learn how to paint, you like the kind of way, because what I do is I believe in, in, in painting, painting from your, uh, I'm not going to say painting from your convictions, but paint from your, uh, from your heart. The subject matter you paint, any art form, it, it, just, it doesn't have to be painting. It should come from that special place. And a lot of times I see people paint ducks on a pond, you know, a, a, a log cabin in the middle of a, in a, a mountain scene in the background. <laughs> that's not coming from, that's, it, that's something that you saw somebody else do. I mean, that's been done by so many people. And they feel like, uh, Bob Ross did that a lot. They feel like, I'm not making art unless I made a cabin in the wood like Bob Ross did, or I made a little girl in a meadow sitting in the grass, you know, <laughs> some ducks on a pond, or, you know, a cat, <laughs> you know, a pet cat sitting there just chilling out, you know. That's nice. It's okay. Those are great studies, and, and those are great paintings, too. They can be great paintings. I mean, anything can be a great painting. However, everybody's everybody's seen that story. Everybody, you're telling the story when you're painting. And everybody knows, you already, when I say a, a cabin in the woods with mountains in the back, you know exactly what that looks like. In your mind's eye, you already know, you have a picture of exactly what that looks like. It's not a new story. The reason we go to see like Steven Spielberg in the theaters and people like that, He's got a new story. You don't even know what Star Wars is going to be like until you get into the theater, and then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, 3CPO, R2D2. You know, you're learning new things. Before that, you didn't even know what a Jedi was. <laughs> you know? You didn't even know what a Jedi was. You got, you got educated 
Okay, so now, the same thing when you went to the Avatar movie or Matrix, whatever your favorite movie is. You don't know these characters, you know? Even if you like horror movies, you know, you go Freddy Cooper. Yeah, everybody knows who that guy is. Somebody had to invent the guy. Somebody had to say, hold on, this cat don't exist. I'm gonna make a real scary dude and I'm gonna scare, I'm gonna scare the living bejesus out of everybody with this character. And it comes from that, that place, that creative spot. That's why nobody else came up with this story. You know? The hardest thing to do when you're making some art is come up with your story. What is your story? And a lot of times people are just rehashing, or I call it parroting. You know, like a parrot, I don't know if a parrot knows what it's saying or not. It hear, it, sometimes I think they do because I think my, my parents got a, a cockatiel, one of them talking birds. I believe that bird know exactly what it's saying. <laughs> but it does say things it heard the owner say, you know, it, the, it, the human say. It doesn't just start like, okay, uh, I'm going to speak a bird language. Or maybe they are speaking a bird. Maybe animals are speaking a certain language. You know? But at certain times, it kind of learns. I think it's actually learning the definition. It's learning with the humans that are using the word, you know, the way they do it. So um, you're telling the story. It's a language of story. And uh, this painting, all my paintings is telling a story. If you look at my paintings, they're telling stories. They're educating. They're introducing you to some different concepts. You're not going to find a bird or a person in a cabin in the woods with my painting because my painting is going to shock you. It's going to be something you might not like it. It might not be your thing. You might not want it in your living room. But it ain't gonna be something that somebody saw before. <laughs> it's not gonna be a topic that is discussed by somebody. That's the kind of stuff, that's when you're creative with your ideas. And of course, at the same time, you wanna be creative with the imagery, the way you tell it. It's not, okay, now I have a great idea for a story, but now look at the way I'm telling the story. You know, you know. Look at the expression that Wahan Sanoka has on his face. Look at look at uh, the way I made. I depicted John Romp in a way that he did not depict himself because he was basically a propagandist. He was trying to, to to create a situation where he wanted to. He didn't want the people from England to think well, we over there jacking these natives up, just like Cortez. We jacking them up. He didn't want them to think that because he knew there was some conscientious English people who would have said, hey, man, this, this is some uh, barbaric stuff you're doing, man. So they had to make up some pro propaganda like, oh, the natives are benefiting from us here. They love us. <laughs> I mean, even though we're killing them, and we know we are, but they in England, they don't know that. Uh, look, here's some of the natives right here. Look, this is the, this is the queen herself. And the reality is that the person they called Pocahontas, whose name was really Matoka, she was replaced. She was replaceable. Yes, yeah, she was lined up to be a princess. But once they had kidnapped her, another person took her place because she was no longer available to the tribe to fulfill her duties. Now, they did mourn her. They did miss her. She was not with the, the, the colonizers voluntarily. She was taken and she wanted to go back, but she had spent so much time as a hostage, she made the best of it. She got used to it. And she got to know her, her uh, oppressors. However, she didn't live that long. She was only 
she was barely 20 when she died. That's if she was 20. She might have still been a teenager. Because even by John Ross' record, she was like eight years old. And uh, I mean, this John Smith's record, she was, he estimated her age to be about eight years old in 1608 when he first met her and found out her importance. And then only, she was abducted in, 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 13, in 1613. So you're talking about five years later, she's 13 years old when she was taken. So could you imagine your 13 year old child is being taken by some people from another country that you've never seen before. Can you imagine her terror? She doesn't speak your language at all. All this stuff about people who speak language. Yes, the English had about a handful of people who knew some of the other, some, some slightly related languages from natives. They didn't have the full communication, the full vocabulary. Uh, but they had enough to kind of, they, they had a linguist with them. You know, they were mercenaries. They had a linguist with them. And what the linguist was doing was figuring out, basically his main job was to figure out who the enemies or the people of the land they wanted to take. So they were trying to, trying to find out who Juan, who, who Juan Sonoka's enemies are. Who can we ally with to get rid of the guys whose land we want to take? <laughs> So there was no real, uh, there was no real love or, or wanting to help uh, the Tsenik Mocha, the, the Powhatan, the people they call the Powhatan. That's why they never really put together their real history. They never really put together the truth about the people. They had to make up something because they was really a, very separate from these people. And they really were more or less uh, adversaries to each other, contemporary. In real life, Opek Chanakano, Wahan Tanoka's brother, got shot in the back while discussing peace terms. As a prisoner, he was already shackled and handcuffed. He wasn't even as a warrior when he got shot in the back. He was captured through treachery. They said, okay, we want to we wanna discuss peace. And in reality, the only thing they really wanted to do was get him in a, a compromised situation. They got his best warriors, warriors drunk in celebration because his older brother, much older brother, had already died. And he had what they call Matoakas or where they had, um, they had uh, Pocahontas' peace. And Pocahontas' peace was a hostage situation. You know, if you value your daughter, uh, Wahan Tanoka, don't attack us. If you attack us, we're going to kill her. That's basically what the peace was. This this, this um, painting could easily be called, not the abduction of Matoka, it could be called Matoka's Peace. Because that's actually how the peace was established. I think just right now, just at this moment, I just discovered what the subtitle of this painting is. I have this painting has two titles. It's called Matoaka's Peace, and it's also called the Reduction of Matoaka. As a matter of fact, I might make this one, I might make the subtitle Abduction of Matoaka, and I might make uh, the actual title Matoaka's Peace. Hello, how you doing? Hey, we got a Matoaka right here. Uh, Tia Vaz, how you doing? How you doing? Shucks, I should get you to pose. I need some more detail for my pose. Pose like this and send me your picture so I can have more detail. I'll make uh, Matoaka's face. I'll make your face Matoaka's. <laughs> you know? I'll do that if you're interested. Now, if you're not interested, I understand. I definitely understand that. And send it to my, go into my, uh, inbox and send that chumpy to me. Matter of fact, anybody who think they make a nice Matoka to fit in that picture right there? Because I'm going for my, my I'm going for my memory, you know? 
Uh, that Matoka right there is just from my mind. I don't have any real references. I don't have any, I don't have an actual photo. You know, I'm kind of synthesizing her face in there, you know? And so, uh, but sometimes I just, you know, I went over there and checked it, uh, just that quick, I went over there to check the, uh, see the she was in our room and I saw you and I said, oh my gosh, she looks, and you know, I was in that, that, that right side, that right side of my brain, the creative side of my brain. So she could be, that's my toe, look at that face, it's perfect. That's kind of what I want, you know, that's what I want in there. Now, the thing about it, I can change my mind, I can want something else just that much later, you know. <laughs> You know, I, I'm always bouncing now. I mean, I'm not not gonna be set, not gonna be set on one particular thing too much. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna bounce when I need to bounce. You know, no hard feelings, but homeboy gotta bounce when he gotta bounce. <laughs> Okay, so now I got that nice green coming out the right side. Ah, yeah, I like that. That's adding something different than the whole. See, I have orange here. What I have is I got blue, this this shade of blue. And I'm gonna change that a little bit. Same thing with the purple and the clouds. And then I got this orange, yellow, and a little white. Then I have this green, and now I just bounce this other element in the corner. It was dark over there before, and I still have the dark. I still had a dark, and I can bring in some more dark, but I got that 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 uh, conquistador. I have that uh, English invader dude. He's dead. He's got two arrows in his in his heart, <laughs> in his chest anyway, and he's done, man. He's over with. And uh, so, like I said, it's a whole battle. I don't even like to talk about. It. I like people to, to come to their own conclusions. I paint it the way I paint it. And then you can conclude it whatever, whatever way you want to. I ain't gonna try to tell nobody nothing. I'm just gonna paint it. Uh, I remember the old days when I was in New York and I was just a little shy, little, little light-skinned, high yellow boy up in New York. And all these big shot gallery people, it was just not my world at all, man. I, I, was, I was like an alien, man. <laughs> But all these people was like, yes, and they all kind of talk, kind of like this, and I think your inspiration is, uh... And when I got around those people, I had some nice paintings like this sitting up there on the wall, you know? And a lot of times, people would say, well, who's the artist? I'm standing right there beside the painting. And this is back in the day. And I said, well, how come they don't think I, I'm the painter? They're looking for somebody else. They ain't even looking for me. <laughs> and then they was like bringing up all the name of these artists. And I did take art history in, in college and stuff. But some, I, I mean, there's like a million of these people. You know, you can't memorize all of them, especially when you just, you ain't but 20 some years old yourself. So you just starting out, man. You, you just learning this stuff. Now, I've been, I've known it for a while, so I know a few things now. But at that time, I kind of, I said, but I don't want to get caught, so. And then I didn't want to tell, because a lot of times you tell people something about your painting, and then they, uh, and then they kind of like, you know, you they don't add more to your painting by you just shutting up. Then you do, they start saying, oh, and they'll talk about these artists that I've never even heard of before. I didn't study this guy. They say, oh, you must have studied, uh, um, uh, Jericult, because I see a lot of influence in the dynamic and the story, you know? Then we get all into this stuff. I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I did study him, you know? You know? Yeah, I studied that guy that was a lion. That was always taught by my parents. I mean, I got very good parents. They told me, well, don't lie. You know what I did? Yeah, yeah, Jericho, <laughs> lie, you know? And then somebody bought the painting. I mean, I sold a few of them to kind of pay my pay my bills, like I have some groceries and stuff to eat. When it was back in the day, it was, it was bad, man. <laughs> I was struggling, man. 
I was that was literally for starving. I was struggling, man. I had a little twenty-eight inch waist. Not that I wanted to, because I was starving. <laughs> you know, I was I was on a diet, uh, involuntary diet. <laughs> It was basically not enough money to buy all the groceries I needed. <laughs> diet, you know? Nobody ever do that diet plan. They always want to do some complicated jump. How about that? I ain't got enough money to buy groceries diet plan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nobody ever, you don't see nobody get on YouTube talking about that diet plan, do you? Or I get on television. Look, we have a new diet, because you can't sell that. You can't make no money off of that plan. But it's free. <laughs> In fact, you ain't got no money. So there it is. It works. It works perfectly. <laughs> yeah. The diet plan works perfect. So anyway, uh, all right. So I think I got some pretty good grass going there. So um, I'm gonna leave that kind of like it is for now. I'm gonna go back in and refine that some more. But that's pretty good. So. I'm happy with it. I'm happy with it. With it. I'm happy with it. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is go over to the opposite side of my painting. Because I've been spending a lot of time on the right side. And I'm kind of, this is kind of like a framing device. That's what it's called. It helps to frame that bottom corner. The black was doing it. But really, I would need it the black to kind of go off the edge, and it kind of goes back down. The grass swooshes the eye back up, which is very good. So now what I'm going to do is go to the left side. Then I'm going to go finally and lastly to the sky and work on that. But I might just go to the sky. Sometimes I say what I'm going to do. Then I don't do it. I do something else, you know? All right, so... <clears throat> I think I'm going to get this nice filbert brush here. Uh, and it's a synthetic bristle. And I kind of have, uh, I, I want this to darken off to kind of go some caroscura. You just get some like Rembrandt tapering darks going this way. So to do that, really, I have some dirty medium. When I say dirty, I mean it's just another color in it that is undesirable for the color that I want to put on the canvas. So what I need to do now is get rid of this, put, refresh my, uh, refresh my memory, my uh, medium. It's basically just clean out the old medium. While I'm doing that, let's see what's going on in my room. Hey, where is everybody at? <laughs> Okay, so anyway, um, okay, so that's it. Uh, let me pan this over a little bit so there's a little bit more of a view, get a better view of my, uh, get a better view of my uh, whole paintings. Okay. And uh, this painting right here, uh, I got it close enough to finish, just like this one and this one. At this point, and also the Nipsey Tupac one, and what I'm going to do at that point, I'm going to um, just work on these as I feel like it and start a new painting because for 2020, in terms of big paintings, I have five paintings I want to do. You can see I already have three. So I want two more. So I'm gonna start on that fourth one probably next week. At the same time where I'm starting on that one, or just before I start on that one, I'm gonna do a smaller commission piece for a person that I met off of Facebook, which is pretty cool, and I'm pretty excited about that. So probably uh, we're talking August, September, uh, which will be my fourth piece, fourth big one, and a commission piece. The commission piece is smaller. Uh, of course, you can see I work somewhat large. 
Uh, that one's going to be 24 inches by 36 inches. Or it may change a little bit. I don't know. I need to uh, probably talk to her and ask some questions. But I'm not really at that space yet to do that. So because I'm kind of finishing stuff up so I can be able to give my undivided attention when I get to that. And also that canvas is still I'm st it's still drying because I'm using oil ground on it. The oil ground just takes a long time. It takes weeks to dry because I really want to have a really nice I want to give I want to give her since she's my face first book patient a really nice product. So I want to give her the very nicest product that I can do. And if anybody want a consignment painting done, you know, by all means, definitely let me know. And I would love to do something. Uh, you know, if you just say, okay, my living room is this color, and or my bedroom, or whatever room you want done, you know, I could come up with the schemes that will fit your room, everything. We can work it out. Frames, everything. Okay, so... Sometimes it's just a little bit of, at this point, you know, I'm kind of coming up with the overall tones of the painting. I don't really have those down yet because I was really doing a lot of paying a lot of attention to modeling and things like that. But for right now, the overall lights and darks, I should say, of the painting and tones. trying to get that all organized a certain way. Just to make sure that I am the whole, I'm trying to bring the whole composition into harmony more now than I was doing before. In terms of values, darks and lights, because you can do that easier with glazes and things than you can just modeling it from the beginning. And it looks more interesting. And this is the way I like to work. So. so just just getting a little bit of paint some more shadow, deeper shadows in certain areas. To, to bring that section of the painting off. To bring that section of the painting off so that you go into the action part of the image more. So I want to draw the person's eye into the action part of the painting. Just making some of the light areas pop forward, dark areas recede more. But this might be more at this level about making some of the light areas come forward. Of course, the ground shadows. I could really start accentuating those some more too. I want to get those bolder. Um, 
There's a lot of things to address. Almost at the same time, things are popping in my brain. Since I'm on grass, I'm going to just add some darker blades randomly with this silver. And these blades are going to be blue. They're really blue because these are blades of grass that's in a shadow. It's hitting shadow. We have blades of grass that's hitting uh, light, you know, sun. But we also have blades of grass that's hitting shadow as well. And you can see I have a couple of little blades of hidden light. At the same time, some are just really in the darkness. And they complement, you know, the light and dark work together, not separately. You, you, you don't have necessarily one as a tool of composition. A good painting. You don't have one without the other. You know, you need both. To make things work. But somebody was saying, okay, well, you know, we're religious. How come God just don't kill the devil? He keeps killing all the people. Well, you wouldn't have anything without the devil. <laughs> He's just as important as God. Because essentially the devil is every person. Everybody is capable. Everybody is capable of doing evil, bad. What you, what some people call sins. I guess they have a, def, a word to def, define that thing. But at the same time, the same individual is capable of very extreme good. Isn't that amazing how that works? So built inside of the tree of good and evil. That's the next painting I'm going to be doing. Built inside of every person is the tree of good and evil. That's where it's located, inside of you. It's not in a garden. You are the garden. <laughs> you know? The person is the garden. It's, it's, an, it's an analogy. It's not a real place. It's a... Uh, it's, it's, it's a way to teach people psychology in the old days, in the ancient days. I mean, there was no Sigmund Freud to give you the id and the ego and the superego. It's the same thing. The id is the devil. <laughs> the superego is God Almighty in heaven. And the ego is you, the Jesus Christ person that's making the decision. He's tempted. He's taken to the mountaintop. To be tempted by the devil. You know, that's the id. For anybody who studies psychology formally, you wouldn't know what that is. Think about it. Just look at a lot of the characters in the Bible. And you're going to see the id, the ego, and the super ego. <laughs> Just look at it that way. I mean, be an artist for a minute, you know. Be some, Think out of the box for a split second. Sometimes it's hard because a lot of people, they just, no, that's not what my pastor told me. Well, guess what? My dude is just parroting, again, the parrot, what somebody else said a hundred years ago and a hundred years before that. <laughs> and, it's all, and then it's a thousand years have gone by and it's all confused now. This confusion is going on. And so you're just spreading confusion. And then you have worlds of people fighting over religions and edicts and doctrines. It's called ISIS. It's called the American troops over in countries jacking your folks up. <laughs> you know? Because we support another group of people that's religious freaks. You know, we support Israel. All these are people who missed it. You know, that... None of their stuff was originally talking about that. None of the, I don't even, I doubt if even the, the characters are real. You know, just like this painting. The painting is, yeah, the characters have existed perhaps. 
perhaps. I mean, other, under different names. Her name was Matoaka. Her name was not Pocahontas. There's one story where she was in love with Captain John Smith. Then there's another story by the natives that she wasn't. Which one is the truth? I believe the natives. Well, the natives don't have a big voice. The people who conquer does. So that's the thing that goes forward. So which is the truth? I mean, there is no truth. There is human beings, and human beings tell stories. Human beings have uh, systems that they put in place to, to live by. You know, you can even go see the chimps in Africa. They have a little, little system too, you know. You break the rules and you're a dead chimp. <laughs> I saw that on like Mutual Omaha's Bio Kingdom. I said, man, that chimp ain't smart right there. He can get himself in trouble because the, the king and the queen, the boss chimp, they're getting a little ticked off right there. And the other ones is going to do with the, whatever that one want them to do. Whatever that one think is right, they're going to check in with them. And do give a nod. They go out there and just take that other chimp out, man. <laughs> and what's the difference between the people say, well, we didn't come from the monkeys. I don't know. It's some monkey stuff that's been going on between humans here lately. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of parallels. <laughs> you know, who are we to think that we're the, we're, we're the best? All these life forms on Earth. Who are we to think that we're the life form that's supposed to be? Hey, even though and we, we try to communicate with other species, I mean, we're really arrogant. We really think we're the top thing. You know, everything want to talk to us, does it? Maybe it doesn't. I mean, why do you think so? You know, self-centeredness. You think you're a great thing. And a lot of times when people think that, what they do is they have to think something else isn't so great. Because after all, as compared, I'm really, really great. And so something else isn't as great. I mean, it's a subtle kind of prejudice. People say, well, I'm not prejudiced. Everybody's prejudiced. Everything is prejudiced. Even the animals, you go watch Mutual Walmart's Wild Kingdom, you, Jim Joker's prejudice, man. <laughs> so we didn't just learn this at a human level. We didn't learn this as people. This stuff, when, when you were evolving to get to be a person, you were already trifling, man. <laughs> yeah, trifling. Human beings are some trifling things on this earth. We jacking up the environment. If we don't get control right now, now I don't want to, I'm not even, I stop. I don't even want to try to tell people what to do politically because I see all these people on Facebook. Every time I see somebody that mentions something political, I delete them, I block them. <laughs> because all that is is a troll trying to manipulate an idiot. I can think for myself. I don't, and I don't want to be persuading nobody else either. I used to try to do that. I said, man, well, I'm just, I'm making more enemies than anything, trying to persuade somebody else to think like I think. No, I'm a unique individual. I think this way. You're a different unique individual. You think that way. Now, the way democracies work is whoever had the most in common rules. It's just all to it. Uh, can it be considered prejudice? Yes. But you live in a place where the people with the most common ideas rule, and you're not the most common, and your ideas are not the most common. So there is a give and take in everything. And so a long time, one group of people has always been the takers. Another group of people has always been the givers. And one group might not be so considerate to the next group. Well, you look for some compassion for the group that's in power, from the group that's in power. You look for, if you're part of the group that's disenfranchised, you're looking for compassion from the group that is enfranchised. Because everybody really wants, at the end of the day, everybody wants to be part of the group that is enfranchised. Now, if you're, if, but sometimes people just want, I want my group enfranchised. Well, your group doesn't have the power to be enfranchised. It just doesn't. 
So you're wanting something that cannot get done. So now you have to compromise. Well, that's selling out. Yes, but you're part of, you, you, you don't want to be that chimp that got taken out <laughs> by, the, by the boss chimps, by the alpha chimps. Because the, whoever, because whatever the alpha chimps say, that's what go. Uh, and then you got you to gotta get some more chimps on your side. <laughs> you know? You ain't, if you don't have the chimps on your side, then you have some trouble, man. I, I don't know if I'm going to go for that, you know? You're going you're gonna to have a rough life. You know, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be a hard road to toe. And if you look at everybody who went against that, you see they had a hard road to toe. They didn't. They didn't fare well. Well, people would say, "Well, that's a coward. You got to stand up." But you know, if there's a hundred guys in the room and all of them got machetes, and all you got is a slingshot, and you by yourself, and maybe you got one dude say, "Hey, I got you," and he ain't got nothing. At least you got a slingshot. This cat ain't got nothing. You got to look out for him, so that's a whole lot. <laughs> You're gonna lose, man. There's a very good chance whatever you're trying to do ain't gonna work out the way you think it is. So uh, best not to do nothing. The best is to actually come up with a compromise. You know? Uh, compromise is really what democracy is supposed to be about. I mean, we had to sink. The Louisiana Compromise, basically between the, the Americans and the French, where, well, actually it was Napoleon, or somebody like that, where Napoleon needed the money to fight the wars in Europe. The Americans was willing to give him the money, but the Americans said, well, you got to give up St. Louis, and, and, and I mean, the, the, the state of uh, Louisiana. At that time, the state of Louisiana covered parts of uh, Alabama, Tennessee. I mean, it was huge. Half of the Mississippi. And uh, so Napoleon had to give up off of a whole lot of claimed territory. Back to history again. And what he got out of the compromise was, it's not what he didn't want to give it up now. He never, he never wanted to give that up. But he needed that money really, really desperately, and the Americans weren't trying to do him any favors. They was trying to do was get the land, and you said the land, they was trying to build that country. And they know over the long run, they was gonna milk that land, with slaves, unfortunately, <laughs> and make a whole bunch of money. And guess what, Napoleon was gonna do the same thing, if he could have gotten his way. But instead, the Americans got their way. So that's how things work. It's compromises. So that's called illusion. You know, it's certain compromises. Uh, Lincoln, uh, when it was time to free the slaves during the Civil War, there was compromises with the South. The South basically seceded, but then in surrender, compromises were still made because these people could fight down to the last person and that meant some more Union troops would have died and Lincoln might have been in a much more precarious position. Uh, I mean, he had ended thing for his presidency so he's got eight years. Then another guy's gonna take over. He can take the war in any direction he wants. So compromises have to be made because there's time restraints, there's all kinds of things going on in the world. Okay, so what I did was take a little blue to kind of tone and add shadow. Okay, so who's in the room? Natasha Anderson, hey cuz, how you doing? Good to see you here. Hey, let me see if I can, I'm going to hit the button. You might want to come on camera, I mean, you know me. But if you don't, I understand. I'm in my studio, uh, just kind of uh, working with my tones, my lights and darks and adding a couple of elements basically not just to, i mean not just lights and darks but you know tones shades of color you know that's going to go this way or that way and um i think now i think i've done i wanted before i started addressing the light areas of the painting i did want to address some of the shadow and i think i did a pretty 
satisfactory job of it. Uh, I think I want a little bit more of this. Uh, I don't know how much uh, of this is blue, how much of this is black, but I want a little bit more in here. And this this brush might be too fat. So I want to go down to this next size. See how this works out. Had some white in that brush now and created a, a gray. And I'm gonna use this gray over here. This is a little glaze with this darker tone over here. Let's get a little slight blendation going because I do want a darker tone on this brush. And I got some semi-hard edges here. I want to soften down some. Okay, so now that I have that, I'm going to go into ultramarine blue, a little Mars black, accent on purple. Just a smidge of viridian green. Just tap into, it's mostly uh, ultramarine blue though. I'm putting it on somewhat fluidly. It's got right much medium. My medium right now is 30% Galkit, 20% linseed oil, and 50% Gamsol. That's the medium that I use. Now this medium is I mixed months ago. So I don't know if some of the Gamsol might have evaporated out of it. Even though I have caps on them, but the Gamsol is still going to catalyze or evaporate away at a faster rate than the oil, even with the cap on it. So it might have changed a little bit, so it might be more oil now. But it's okay, because I'm in the, the upper level of the painting, you know, glazing. So it's okay if my oil is a little bit more. I don't mind it. <clears throat> Because, uh, you know, the fat over lean principle, you want to make sure that, and that's how you get that nice jewel-like, that jewel-like um, look out of your paint, you know. Because uh, you get more fat in that thing, but if you go there too quick, you don't want your paint to crack over time. You have a paint that's not... The painting that's not stable. Uh oh, you know, because you can do that with oil. You can get into oil, or you can get a painting that's, um, that, you know, I have some paintings that are older, my older paintings, and I see what time has done actually with my process. And I have changed my process a little bit. And there's not anything that I couldn't correct. Fortunately, the paintings. A lot of the times when you're a student, you just don't have any money. You just don't. So you take a shortcut, you're using student grade this, inferior grade that. And you know, that's the one thing about learning. If, if you have the money, spend the right money and get the right stuff. Uh, it's not that you're being, you don't want to be too precious about your paintings because you're learning. A lot of paintings, it's probably a good idea if they are disposable or if they're not disposable, just something you don't care about, you're not gonna show them. You're just trying to get your experience in, get your practice in. You know, it's just like anything else. If you wanna be a good football player, you probably should come to football practice. <laughs> if you wanna be a good painter, you're probably gonna have to spend some time painting in your studio. And this is really only one way. I mean, you can have a certain natural gift, but if you don't spend that time in the studio, that gift just ain't going to develop. And you get a little development for the few times you do something, but you're not going to get that really great progress that you see other people having. Because unlike the other pre person, you're not dedicating time. And what happens is uh, 
we paint with uh man at one point i think i no, i'm not even gonna say anything because i sold some things so i'm not gonna say what i i'm not gonna say anything was wrong now i want to say that either but you know when you look turn around and look at the back of them you can see a little something it's not anything that that can't be corrected if somebody really loves the painting it all can be corrected however it's best not to even have it, you know. And as a student, you're learning those things. You know, you really are learning those. And uh, so you make those mistakes, but people like the image that you made, and they want to purchase the painting. And they know that you're a student, so they get your painting. And then sometimes as a student, I must admit, I have a lot of family members with my paintings. I have a lot of family members. And a lot of the paintings, I remember one time I was sitting around, okay, if y'all looking, don't get, don't get upset now. No, don't get upset now. Don't get your britches all messed up. I'm not really trying to diss or nothing. I'm just saying, I said, man, where did I, where are you? know, I was sitting around reflecting, what did I do with that painting I did when I was 10 years old? Or? And then somebody, and then I go over to my mom's house looking for it, it's over my sister's house. <laughs> she didn't tell me she took it. My mom didn't tell me that she gave it to her or whatever. But then she announces, oh yeah, by the way, I have your painting. But well, where at what point are you gonna let me know? <laughs> you know? Do I get a say on it? Well, you know, when you leave home, you left it, and then now your mom's got it. Everything that you didn't take actually belongs to her, I guess dad so yeah maybe so but I was painting the acrylic then so what I found out was acrylic is an easier acrylic is easier than oil it's easier to master acrylic acrylic is um, it's very forgiving oil is also forgiving but in a different way you can do more but also it's harder. So it's forgiven in the fact that you can do more, so you can, if you do something that's a little bit too to the, this way or that way, you can actually get a comeback from it, you know? If you know what you're doing. All of this stuff requires you know what you're doing. Which as a student, guess what? Most people don't know what they're doing because that's why they're a student. They're a student because they know they don't know what they're doing, so they're going somewhere where they can learn to do what they're doing. So, uh, like I say, you buy a student grade painting, or you make a painting, you know, you might even be still in high school. I did a one-man show even when I was in high school, and I was winning all kinds of awards for the county that I lived in. And, man, I, I didn't, couldn't believe that I had all of this work you know, in my senior year, I said, great day, I was really productive. I produced a lot of stuff. And some of you guys is on my Facebook that went to high school with me. You probably know of, of that, you know, some things I've done. Back at Hermitage High School. Matter of fact, the Oklahoma painting that's on the wall, I painted that with Mr. Alan Ross. Mr. Alan Ross is one of my favorite teachers. Of course, Miss Cheatham was, and Mr. Miko and Jury, a lot of them people. Love them. Wonderful people. I wonder if they're still around now. I, mean, I really would like to talk to them and meet them again. I really would. They were so wonderful. That was a wonderful time in my life, too. Even though I was kind of like a little bit of a quiet, contemplative kid. But I could be outgoing, too. Quite quite jovial and quite, uh, well, my creative nickname in high school was Mr. Flamboyant, just to give you some idea <laughs> what I was like in high school. Because I was all, I would, I would make costumes. Literally, my aunt, my aunt Bernice was a very good sewer. I think she taught my mom to sew, because my mom could sew pretty good too. Uh, but she's the oldest. And when I went to my, in my uh, 
freshman year at college, you know, I went to VCU, which is right my kind of like in my hometown. But my aunt Bernice lived in a city close to there. I was, you know, basically moving more from the country. And uh, so I could ride bicycle, you know, cheap, school. So I went to stay with them. And, uh, but before that, I always, you know, they had a swim pool near their house, and I used to like to swim. And uh, so we would go over there and spend Saturdays and things like that. And of course, she lived with my grandma. And uh, she taught me how to sew. And I would, you know, polymer, funkadelics, all that kind of stuff. I was making outfits like that in high school. And then I would wear them in <laughs> to school. I would wear the outfits. And, you know, as like uh, moving, you know, a motion art, you know. I was in the lunchroom, in my classrooms. <laughs> wearing costumes and different sculptural type of things outfits that I made you know essential I mean not that I was going to want to be a fashion designer or anything because I didn't I just got the notion to do that and did it okay because so now I'm kind of getting a little bit of a, a precursor to some glazing. I really, I'm just treating myself to this. Really, I'm not at that stage. I really shouldn't be doing that, but as I'm sitting here telling these little stories here, again, it's a form of meditation. You know, like yoga, it makes you feel better. So, I decided to paint something that made me feel good in a way that, that makes me feel good. And so I did a little modeling in advance because I'm not really interested. And I'm saving all these paintings. I'm saving because that's like the that's like the dessert, you know. It's like the dessert when you the painting gets to a certain place, you savor that bad boy. I remember when I was young, my sister, my brother a little bit, we were kind of my older, the ones closer to my age anyway, and. Uh, we would uh, kind of sit around with the dessert. We don't want to save it. Do nobody want to eat their dessert too fast because you ate the dessert too fast, it's gone, and then your other brother or sister is still working on their dessert and they're teasing you, see? <laughs> you know, they still got their dessert in full bloom. You've already had your fun and it's over with, and now you got to watch them. <laughs> Man, I had. I had an interesting childhood. I had some interesting brothers. I still got them. Now, my brothers and sisters, well, you know, we, we was an interesting bunch. I might have to say, oh, maybe it was me. Maybe it was me. <laughs> I must have been a terrible. No, I won't. I think I was a pretty good brother and son. I don't know. Maybe not. I don't know what I was. You know, I mean, things are. This is what I discovered what they are and then you know it ain't a whole lot and then you know if you have you go through series in life of self-discovery and depending on how far you backwards and didn't know how backwards you are is how much discovery you actually get to go through <laughs> people call it drama but and you fall behind that's why you're getting drama a lot of people say, why do I get so much drama? Because you were so primitive with yourself. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to say jacked up. I like to say that word. But you were so jacked up <laughs> that you had to go through all that just to get to a place where somebody else already was that didn't have to get jacked up like that. And that's why some people go through crap and others don't go through so much crap. But what I found out is everybody kind of goes through some crap in some shape or form is given to the human experience to experience crapola. Okay? It's part of life, man. Crapola. It really is. <clears throat> 
And so I say embrace the crapola. Embrace it. Don't try to shrug away from it. Don't try to get all these things to conjure it away. Run towards, they say, you know, run towards it. You know? So, uh, and the sooner you do that, the faster you'll come out of it. That's what I think. Okay, so I need to get my rag technique working because the rag is a part of my painting tool as well. Sometimes you, especially when I'm painting, sometimes wet on dry or gives me the ability to kind of put a skin glaze over something and put it on, see what the color's like, then pull it back to some level. Just give it a little glow. Yeah. And that's it. That's the glow I want. That's the glow I want. Okay, so now I need to work on the smoky smoke. I need to determine where that's going to be, how it's going to be. And uh, right now I think I got a black hole in a certain section of my painting that I need to rectify some level and I might have to break out another brush for that I don't want to but I might have to and I think I need some smoke even though there's not a person shooting in this area let's assume this guy did some shooting and it risen kind of because I don't really want that area right there to be so dark it's too dark let me before I do that let me just Look at some of my reference drawings just to see, just to remind myself of something, perhaps, or not. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh-huh. See, now I remember. So what I'm going to do is, I don't want titanium white anymore. I'm going to use zinc white which is a more translucent or transparent white. And uh, it does a better smoke than titanium. Sometimes when I want, I combine them. I actually will mix between the two whites where I want my smoke to be more opaque, block out. In other areas, more zinc where I want the, the, the um, even though the zinc kind of goes toward like a yellowy tone, And the titanium kind of is like a cool, a cool, like a bluish white, more so. Or just maybe it's kind of right down the middle. But it leans toward the cool side. Okay, so now, let me get an image in my hand because I don't want to forget. One of my little mock-up design images. Because this is kind of crucial because I'm really changing the way the eye is going to flow right now. But right now I just got this black hole and the eye is just going there and getting lost. And I'm painting wet over top of dry. And I'm using zinc white and I'm using a soft sable brush. And this is the number eight round. And it's almost like a mop brush but it's around, but I've used it a lot, so <laughs> it turned from around to a mop brush somehow. I'm just gonna build a little smoke coming on up. Just gonna see how that smoke's gonna drift. The smoke is drifting this way. I haven't really done the smoke coming that way. You see I got smoke that way. But I'm gonna build it from the right and go left. I'm covering over painting that's already dry, painting wet over dry now. And have some more dense areas of smoke, which I like, and of course more translucent or transparent sections of smoke coming down here. 
I'm just dappling a little bit of zinc white. I don't really have it mixed with anything just yet because it's actually, it, since it's translucent, it's not white because it's showing the darker tones underneath. So it's actually going on gray. So that's what you want to consider. People say, well, don't use white straight up. See, you don't, you shouldn't make any rules. You know, the first rule of painting or <laughs> art is forget it. If somebody tell you a rule, please forget it, man. <laughs> I mean, if it's like building the structure, okay, get the technical part right, because you don't want the painting to fall apart in five or six years. However, uh, when it comes down to actually painting, don't use white, don't use black, straight out the tube. Man, come on, man. They need to stop with that. A lot of people are trying to pass themselves off as art teachers and teaching that. And a lot of times, most people are parroting again. They heard somebody else say it. It makes them sound smart. Like, oh, if I say this, I'm going to sound like a really experienced artist. Yes, don't use black. I mix my blacks by using, you know, no. Do anything you want to do. <laughs> Any and everything. It's infinite. There is no way you have to do anything. Literally. Even Jackson Pollock, he said, I'm not even going to use normal gessos and stuff. His stuff is falling apart. But the paintings exist the way he wanted them to exist. You still see the image. His technique wasn't that great. He invented some stuff that people, other people really weren't doing that much. That's why he became unique. That's why he kind of established a, a niche for himself. Because he was saying, okay, the Indians put the sand, you know, the Indian sand paint, the Native American, I should say, the indigenous natives, sand paint. And so he went west and he saw this, and he started to incorporate that into his artwork. Because the sand painter was, you know, of course, this behavior is coming from the, the left side. So this is a spiritual process. So Jackson Pollock is splattering paint. So literally, that's what I was talking about earlier, so that's good. So that ties this in to the conversation that I was having earlier about the spiritual process. And that spiritual process is you paint from the right side, of the creative side of your brain, the part that's automatic, the part that doesn't need to think, the part that's already thought about that stuff. And it could have thought about it generations for, for you. You couldn't even inherit this from your caveman grandparents, <laughs> you know? They might have been doing something around a campfire somewhere in Africa or the Antarctic somewhere. Who knows, you know? Scandinavia, who knows where your, your ancestors, all of them came from? And, uh, and that's it, you know? And so, uh, and so you're kind of tapping into that. You tap in to your to your ancestors. Yes, I tap into my ancestors. Everybody in my family who's died, I actually say hello to them every night before I go to bed. I just remember them, acknowledge them. Okay, well, where you come up with that, man? I just came up with it. <laughs> Who taught you that? I just decided, you know? Man, that's weird. Okay, thanks. It's okay. Everybody lived a life once. Everybody got to come to their own conclusions, man. Think for yourself. And try to discover something. You know? But if you're not thinking, if you're just getting stuff that other people say is this and that, you just, uh, you know, you're not thinking, you're not having to think. You're not challenging anything. See, good things can take a challenge and come back out the other side. Okay, that's that's the way to do that. That's the right answer. That's it. And you say, well, I can't really come to that conclusion. No, you gotta always be testing that because, for example, there's a lot of people, you know, I saw a guy who said, oh man, I ain't wearing no mask. Three months later, dude sitting up in the ICU room. Everybody, you know, everybody pray for me. Well, God dog, man, uh, what you doing up in the restaurant smacking down on the daggone steak and potato, man, in the middle of COVID, man? 
know, that might not have been the smartest move, man. But you're so used to no COVID-19. You see this happening all over the place. I ain't trying to criticize you. You don't want to wear a mask. Don't wear a mask. But don't argue when you're sitting on the ICU fighting for your life either, you know? Don't, don't argue with nobody but yourself. You can't be upset with nobody because you made that decision. People say, well, I live with it. If I die, I die. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, man. Enjoy yourself while you're doing it. You know, there's people that they smoke cigarettes, they drink alcohol, they're having a good time. And they might die five or ten years sooner than the other guy who he lived a pasty, pasty boring life. So, you know, there is something to, hey, I'm not going to inhibit my life. I'm going to live like I always live, like a free man. I hear people saying that. Okay, then go ahead and do so. However, when you get to the point where you start seeing the pearly gates and the light at the end of the tunnel is calling your name, head to the light or to the dark. <laughs> I'm you know, head to one of them places, man, because it's just calling you now, man, and you can fight all you want, but I think Mr. Grim Reaper is going to say, okay, come on to me, Bubba. Come on, Papa here. <laughs> you know? However, live your life the way you want, because you only have one, and the only person that needs to be satisfied is you. You can't convince me. Nobody's come back with a camera a camcorder and say, okay, I brought some guests back from, from heaven, and we got all kinds of pictures when we was on vacation there, and uh, I got some postcards, I brought back souvenirs. Nobody's done that. Nobody. Oh, well, there's some people who had a near-death experience. The key and optimal word is they didn't die because they're still alive. You know that? Their body didn't compose and turn into a skeleton. And, you know, they six foot under the ground. They still in the, in the hospital. And we got all kinds of technology. Think about it, you put a person in hypnosis, they swear something. You, you know, they swear they're a dog. Bark like a dog. Woof, woof, woof. You know? Jump on all fours. Go to sleep. Whatever. That person is going to see and believe exactly what is suggested to him. That's how the brain works. When you go to go to sleep and you dream, you're dreaming, man. And you're going to dream with that subconscious mind. Of course, I can paint it. I've learned how to paint it. Other people, it's involuntary. With some people, it's voluntary. I can have a dream full of weight right now while I'm talking paint. Matter of fact, this is a dream right here, what I'm painting. It's a dream. I'm fully conscious of it. I'm literally painting a dream. That over there, another dream. That over there, another one. <laughs> I got a bunch, I got even dreams that my mom painted that I have it on schedule to paint. That's going to be 2021, 22. Well, I better hurry up and do it. My mom's getting a little older. I want her to see it. But she came up with some great concepts. And I believe she got those from her right brain, that creative side. And I actually did some uh, digital illustrations of some of these for some projects that she was involved in. <clears throat> and I'm going to make paintings out of those. I'm going to translate some of that into, because some of her actual dreams is off the chisine one. And it's relevant actually to a lot of stuff we see going down right chill now. Very relevant. My mom. She's got that, she's got the gifties. She's got the gifties, man. And uh so yeah, uh <clears throat> I'm gonna do some of those too. Problem is, I don't have enough time to do all the paintings I want. <laughs> Unfortunately, 
I wish I could paint. I gotta get. I'm on uh, my number one thing that I want to work on is to paint this type of painting faster. Faster, 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 faster. And the whole idea is, is I could get these paintings into fruition, into manifestation, create them, in other words, creator powers, to create them, to make them exist out of the mind world into the 3D world. This is the 3D world, everywhere else is the mind world. The spirit world is the mind world. The mind world is, you have, you have some, you can, some people separate the mind from this. No, all of this stuff, including your physical body, is interconnected. They're not separate things. You can, you can organize your thoughts and think of them separately to help you conceive of it better and understand it better. But they are the same thing, not separate. Like I said, when you're learning from somebody else, you just, you, you're kind of a person who's been taught, you've been trained. Then there's some people who just know. I'd rather be the person who know than a person who's been taught because the person who's been taught, he can't synthesize. That person can't process new things. That person has to wait for somebody to give them another idea. Like an artist, I've given you another idea. The person has to wait for that idea to come. It's better to be the person with the ideas than the person that's waiting on ideas. It's just better. Okay, so what I'm doing is that I'm hitting with this smoky effect. And this is a glaze. Now, I'm not, I don't have a lot of toner in this. I'm gonna put a little bit more um, oil in it. But sometimes the oil makes it too smudgy goes on too painterly. I really want this to go on kind of powdery and smoke up more smoky like. I'm using this synthetic mongoose brush. I really the, think the sable brush still does a better job. But the mongoose brush is a little bit more stiff than sable. Sable is very soft. And uh, mongoose is more stiff so I can force the paint exactly in the spots and places into the other color, you know. And when you do force the paint into a color that already is dried and hardened on the painting, and those colors would have would adhere and become one. But sometimes if you just lightly glaze the painting on, the other color is still separate, you know, still can be seen as a hard line or a separate thing. And you really want those two colors to become one. So in doing that, you sometimes want to use a slightly more stiffer brush to give you that illusion that you're looking for. Okay, you see me, I'm kind of painting underhanded like this. That means I'm using my left brain. Not really, because I'm doing smoke. I'm just feeling where the smoke should go. I'm not thinking about it and feeling, okay, this is how, this is too light, this is too dark. Smoke should be like this and that and the, and the third. Okay, so I'm going to back up from it too because I'm close. So my information could be wrong because I'm too close to it. Okay, so now, oh yeah, that, see that little guy back there? It's on his knees, he's popping forward more. That's exactly it. So separation of uh, foreground and background, that's what this is called separation of foreground and of course Wahan Senoka or you could pronounce it Wahan Seneca depends uh, some people I heard a Madapana person say Wahan Seneca I heard a Pamunkey person say Wahan Senoka <laughs> so, uh, and then if you go to other uh, Agorian language speakers in other places even though they don't speak the exact language their pronunciation. I mean, you could get English and go Scotland and go to, to to London and then go to Ireland and get three, four different pronunciations. Then come to America, get another pronunciation of English, and then go to Australia, get another one. So, you know, there is dialects even 
from a language that almost became extinct and has been to some degree I'm going to say I'm not going to say resurrected when I say resurrected I mean that there might have been people that were still speaking it privately in their homes uh, but there was only a handful of people you know maybe not even a good thousand maybe it was a thousand maybe it was two or three thousand but it just wasn't known much so, uh, you know, but, you know, you get somebody with a lot of money, like Disney, they make a movie, and they hire a linguist who is a professional, and what he does, he takes other languages and starts to rebuild other words that even those people didn't have, and that stuff comes together, and the next thing you know, you have start to have almost, not a full language, but you start to have a pretty decent little language group that you can kind of start taking some pride in if you have some Native American heritage from the Virginia area since it's Seneca Mocha I should say keep calling them Native American they actually have a name it's kind of like calling me um, calling somebody from Brazil South American no you're from Brazil specifically so specifically these are at the Seneca Mocha to Seneca Mocha language and basically I'm just taking a little bit of smoke out of the dark and then some of the positive images, like this guy's war club, uh, it's, it, it starts to get more pronounced. It starts to look, come to the fore. It pops it. The eye is a, it's a, it's not an illusion. It's not an optical illusion. It's just you're mimicking. You're seeing something through the smoke. So you're really mimicking what physics do, you know, what light does when it hits smoke and objects inside of that light space, you know, and you want the audience to see something. And so, uh, and you want their eye to focus on something. So, there we go. So now I like that. So now in the center of my painting, I've basically gotten rid of the black hole that existed here. I still have some black hole and I'm going to bring a little bit of light smoke down in there to kind of um, deal with some of that. I don't want too much light smoke. You know, like I say, that, that, that in the old days, that gunpowder smoke, you know, you would see a field, you know. I mean, they tell stories about Napoleon, how the Syrian soldiers would emerge out of the smoke. The reason they would emerge out of the smoke, there was so much smoke from gunpowder. And they didn't know it that Napoleon's elite guard was right on them. Well, how come they didn't know these guys are marching slowly across the field? The field is covered with gunpowder. So you have to do your research, too, when you're coming up with these creative ideas. You don't just want to be just out of your dream state. You're mixing the, the right and the left brain together. I mean, they work together. You're not just all left brain. You're not just all right brain. You're working together to make, especially if you're making a figurative painting, paintings that, that, that literally, and you know, people say, well, I'm an abstract painter. You know, abstract is this simple as this. I mean, a lot of times people get confused because they've gone through impressionism, they've gone through all this stuff. Abstract is abstraction of reality. It's still a realistic painting. The word abstract means abstract reality. It's not reality, it's an abstraction. It's out as it's you make reality abstract. In other words, you take something, you zoom in close, and you take elements from reality, but you can't reference that to anything. It becomes like an abstraction of something. It's still based on something real. <laughs> so you can still call it realistic painting. I know a lot of people that would argue that, but it's true, you know. Uh, abstract is still based on something that's real. Uh, but when you just only do abstract, because I've done abstract painting, I think it's a cop-out because, you know, I could do a painting a day. If all my paintings were abstract, I could probably make three, four, five paintings in one day. <laughs> Ten in one day, maybe. You know, because there's all kinds of ways to fake the funk. Literally, you can fake the funk, man. There's all kinds of ways to do that. So, uh, 
And what it turns into is um, you meet an art curator. That's basically what's happening. You meet an art curator. He says, you know, you can make a lot more money if you can work faster. The person said, really? Because they've been used to being broke for a long time. Yeah. And I know you like to paint, you know, figuratively and realistically, but it takes you a whole month to make a painting, two months. You only can make five paintings. I only can sell them for this much money. So you're going to be broke for a long time this way. So, but I love painting these. I mean, this is what I like doing. But I'm just trying to tell you. So after a few starvation sessions, you know, the guy comes and says, you know what? I started to paint some abstract stuff. What do you think? <laughs> you know, he goes to the car dealership, see that car he wants. You know, so I'm trying to, trying, to, trying to upgrade my house, whatever. And he basically sold out. That's how Abstract became popular, in my opinion. That's why. And it, or the person's lazy. They don't like to do a lot of work. So they just want to just be on, at the French Riviera all the time, have the party with their friends. You know, I want to hang out with Chopin. Bach and Beethoven and all these, these elites of my day. So they were painting, they started doing impress, you know, in front of fast painting. That's what it is. You can call it whatever you want. Man, if you look at, just look at the career of Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, the great masters, Raphael. These guys made 200, 100 and some paintings. These are the guys that originate. These guys was doing it longhand style. For real. Then you look at guys like Picasso. I mean, the guy was 6,000 paintings or something like that. 6,000! Well, cubism. You can paint that pretty fast. I'm not going to say his stuff wasn't original. He had an original vision. He was doing stuff that nobody else was doing. And he made a fortune on it. And that was his genius. But with every boy, he copied Brock. And some other people copied them. And it just and they were copying Africans. <laughs> and the poor African person that had the original idea where they stole from, they didn't get compensated at all. Well, that happens with the pharmaceutical over in Brazil. You know, they go over to Brazil. These people that they call witch doctors think of all these potions and stuff. They go take the potion back to America and England and places to examine it. And then they say, oh my gosh, we have the next pharmaceutical drug. It's going to solve some problems. Well, this little poor dude run around half naked in the Amazon forest, ain't get compensated nothing. And you straight up stole this stuff. <laughs> you didn't come back and give them no billions or nothing that you made. You kept it all for yourself. And the poor, and then you made it so expensive. I mean, you got it for free. You had to do, you ain't doing that much research development. You basically backwards engineering. Backwards engineering is not like inventing it. It takes a whole lot more research and develop, development to invent something than you to take something that you already know works and backwards engineer it. That's easy. So it didn't cost you a whole lot. You already saw the stuff working. You just didn't know exactly why. So you're sitting there figuring that out. And then, because you got to tell people something. You just can't say, hey, take this witch doctor potion and you're going to be fine. Because <laughs> that's what they call it, these guys. These guys must be geniuses because you're stealing from them. But you're calling them a witch doctor. See, so it's all a matter, everything is a matter of perspective. Everything. Nobody has a right answer. That's what I found out. Live long enough on the earth to know nobody has a right answer. Everybody's stealing from each other. Ain't nobody invent nothing. So who invented the wheel? Everybody invented the wheel. And nobody invented the wheel. Because you're never going to know that. I mean, there's certain things in our society. We're not great because we invented something. I didn't invent the, the train and the, air, the airplane and all this stuff. Not everybody else. 
somebody else did, and we benefit from somebody else's genius. That person died and went on to heaven, and we're still benefiting. That person was smart. You weren't smart. You just a person who lived in a society that that person happened to sow into. And you benefited from that person's genius. But you weren't the genius. You're not smart. You're just in a society that benefited from that person. Well, we created this system where these people could exist to do these things. Yes, but then again, no. These systems we created, just like the guy who invented the wheel and the and the, uh, the guy who invented fire. Who, who? I keep assuming it's a guy. Maybe it was a girl because they cook, right? The man went out to hunt. And the woman said they probably built the fires. So she might have been the one that said, it's cold in this cave. My children is freezing in <laughs> You don't know. We assume, we always assume that it's a, a man that's doing everything. Well, we assume that it's, that this a certain culture has done it all and the other cultures ain't do anything. I think it's a time for those assumptions to be put to rest. Uh, nobody invented math. It was invented so long ago. You know? It was invented a long, long time ago. Just borrowed it. And then maybe somebody added a little piece and then another person added a little something extra. But we keep adding to the same thing with artwork. Michelangelo created his, and then Arthur created theirs. They were borrowing from each other. One guy trying to outdo the next guy. Competition is good. And then the next thing you know, you have the Renaissance. And then before that, who was uh, Leonardo's? Uh, who was that? Uh, Brunelletti. Brunelletto, you know, and uh, he worked underneath him in his business, his company where. He made paintings and artwork and bar relief for the for the popes and the, the, the clergy. It's big business. And they started out as apprentice. And in those days there was no art school. You was an apprentice to a master. That's where we get master's degree from. There was a person who had gotten crafty. And what happened was he his dad passed it down to him. His dad passed it down to him. And finally. This guy might not have had any kids. And he decided, somebody said, well, you know, when you die, all of this, all this ability is going to go away. So he said, you know what? I'm going to teach somebody. I'm going to get an apprentice or I'm going to have a college. And if you come and you work for me for free, because my stuff is labor intensive. So if you work for me for free, I'm going to teach you what I know. I'm going to pass down my knowledge. Even though you're not kin to me, I'm going to pass it down because I need somebody to help me. I'm getting older. And like I said, like you said, when I die, I don't have a wife and I don't have any kids. All of my, all of my secrets that have been, my secrets that's passed down and just in my little group. Now, somebody might have had something similar, but they weren't exactly the same recipe as this guy over here. He just did it just a little bit better. And see, so that's how, that's how technology, that's how culture moves. And of course, um, art for art's sake, you know, it happened in Europe because these were just artisans. Nobody was an artist back in the Renaissance days. They were just dudes that, you didn't have cameras. And rich people wanted to show, show off, just like they still want to do today. Look how powerful and rich I am. Take my picture. So he would hire an artist to come in capture his likeness and uh, look I'm rich I'll pay you well you're the only guy that can do it another guy wants me to do it no you come get me I'm gonna pay you more than him to get him you ain't got but so much time then you're off to the next person and so it began it began to be a very very lucrative thing the artists start taking on a rock star status now it's funny that musical arts today is what gets paid, and the visual artists don't. But in those days, the visual artists got paid, and the musical artists didn't. <laughs> so it goes to show you how culture shifts around and changes according to what's invented. I mean, when cameras are invented, the artists start getting less and less important because 
You know, why do I need your painting when I could just take this Kodak right here and just release a shutter and I got an image. And then an average person, not just some rich ar aristocrat, could start keeping their image, having their image preserved. Then somebody thought about the idea, you know what, I'm going to start a business. I'm going to go travel the whole world. And all I'm going to do is expose images. And I'm going to make a, a ton of money. And they did. <laughs> you know, you take one person's idea, like the, like the, uh, the shaman, the witch doctor with the pharmaceutical company, and you just simply exploit them for money. I hate to say it, everything that we seem to do in this society is about exploiting somebody for money. Now, I'm mixing a little bit of titanium right here because I want this color to be really, really intense white. I still put it on thin, so it's going to be slightly translucent, but it's going to be opaque. Now what I'm going to do is wipe this on my shirt and go back to my zinc white. Just make a little bit more translucent effect of it and the outskirts of that more dense white. Now, hopefully what I've done is I shifted the light and dark ratio of this painting and different areas that were dark now it is, is coming to the fore and then Mostly what I'm doing is as a convention to pop my foreground images more to the foreground while allowing my background images to recess and be not something, but you know, um, I don't want too much light on this side of this painting. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into some grays here. I'll go into some grays because I kind of got this kind of flat anyway. I'm going to round off some of this fork stuff just to create a little bit of ambiguity. So a little bit more um, interesting stuff between the foreground and the background. Now, of course, I'm painting completely from my brain. I'm not even really referencing anything now. And this doesn't even look like my preliminary drawings at all. But at some point, you're going to improvise because what you want to do is um, you want to uh, make the painting look good at this point. It's not about your original idea at this point. It's about does this actually, is this working as a whole? always got to be open to to change your mind you know I think that's why I'm so exploratory in my overall views of, of life because as an artist I learned a long time ago you got to be willing you might have some serious thoughts laid up in terms of how you're going to go about doing something but you have to if you want it to work out right wanted to be successful you got to be willing to change your mind a lot of times people are not willing to do that they get dogmatic they get caught up in just one way it's this way or the highway person you know and they can't change they're stuck forever you know maybe it's okay because it's not life or death so so be it but, as an artist, you kind of want to be free from that. You want freedom. You want to be able to have different ideas because without ideas, again, you're painting ducks on the farm now, little cabins and stuff. It's not very interesting. And uh, not to say, I'm not assuming that this painting that I'm painting is interesting to somebody is interesting to somebody else. It is not. The person that the painting is interested in, the person who's interested in the painting, they will come to the fore. The person that's not interested as much, they're going to go, oh, wow, great painting, but that's where it's going to go. And that's generally how it works.
and I'm going to back off from it. See where I'm at? Wait. Yeah, yeah. Let's start getting in there. That's locking in. I'm liking it more and more. I do need some shadows on this side more. So I'm going to go into this area with some ultramarine blue and black. And I kind of knew that I was doing it as I was working on this. And I'm just going to make these uh, four pylons just a little darker. Again, this is not even though I did reference a fort or two, then I invented my own fort, but the way the light falls on these pylons is not the way it was in my reference pictures. But again, that was a reference picture for somebody who, you know, Jamestown area where he built the fort. <laughs> you know, that works for that. I need something that works for my painting. Okay, now by creating that little bit of darker area, and I'm going to probably put darker shadows in, but for right now, I'm going to go ahead and hit it. I think I'm going to hit it with my really, really light blend brush. This allows me to blend really nice wet on wet, which I really like this brush from this. It's a rosemary brush, another set of brushes that I love. But with the rosemary brush gives you a lot of blend capability. But you lose a little bit of control in terms of blend control. And it makes a light, wispy blend. I love the blend. I love the type of blends you can get with it. But sometimes you want to control that blend too. I'm going to just introduce a little bit of warmth in some of this. Here. Just a little bit. That's going to contrast the smoke a little bit. Okay, that looks good. All right, and now I'm going to go back to my blend blend. Now I do have another blend that's a little bit stiffer. I want to see this one first because I could just I have to do more swipes at it, but. I just get that subtle blend that I love. I got a bigger one than this. This is basically the size up from this. But this one gives me a little bit, it gives me some control. The other one is just a big blend areas. And then look, I'm using my finger. <laughs> that's a blend tool as well. And that's free. That's a free blend tool. Blend it back a little bit more light tone into that. Let's get them a little too dark. I want it, I don't want it that dark in this area. I want it dark as we go toward the edges. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty good. Alright, so let me take a peek from a distance, see what I got. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, that's good. And I need some really dark tones. So I'm going to go to my blacky black black. I want to mix a little Daxodon purple. Get some ultramarine blue and a little Mars black. I'm put my deep shadows in there. My deep darks. I'm putting this in as a glaze. Some of these areas I have some somewhat heavy impasto. And I'm not too much from getting a piece of sandpaper, sanding down some stuff too. I'll do that too. If I have too much impasto, or if the pasta, impasto don't work, that's another painting tool. 
different way, emery paper and sandpaper. Often people don't consider that as family tools. Okay. I'm going to try to incorporate some of that, this tone, into these dialogues here. Okay. We'll take a peek. See where I'm at. Then I might go up to the sky. I think I might have done enough painting on the grass and smoke for today. I get some more ideas on subsequent days, but yeah, yeah, I'm liking that. Now I can see the painting draw to the place I wanted to draw to, which is my toe up his face. That's happening a lot more readily now. It is exactly what I want. So I'm somewhat happy, somewhat about that. Okay? And then I'm going to add a couple of little glints of white right around my torque. Probably want the same brush but smaller, but I got black on it. So I'm going to clean it off using my shirt. and see what I can do about it. And this, this smoke is kind of serving as a type of halo around her as well. And I have to think about that some more, so I don't want to paint into that. I don't want to change that just too much yet. I need to do some meditation on it. Doggone it. this little paint tray here and I guess I should put my brushes there because it keeps my brushes from rolling around and getting the handles dirty but just keep my fingers cleaner. But I like to get into my paint so I don't mind getting paint on my hands and fingers. Some people don't like paint on them but it's part of my whole process of getting my whole body, my whole being into my paintings which gives it that organic, gives it that, that feel. Uh, some people's paintings look very mechanical because it's all wrists and they are just bearing down. I do that kind of painting too. I'm trying to paint photorealistic. Very unintuitive. I'm totally in my left brain the whole time. Everything created was done in the design level. And I'm just basically a technician at that point. It, it wouldn't let me go and send me to my settings. Yeah, you got to turn your camera on, Natasha, if you want to go live with me. You got to go into your settings. If you're on an iPhone, you got to go into your settings and turn your camera so on so that Facebook can access it. Because what probably it is is that you have your camera off. And Facebook cannot access it. Once you turn that on, Facebook can access it. Then you go back to Facebook, and Facebook would allow you to go live. I'm going to drink a little H2O right now. Boy, the gallon is cold. Now it's, it's not room temperature, but it's not nice and icy cold. I think what I need to do now is sit down and meditate. So I'm going to get one of my mock-ups and in every studio the most one of the most important tools is to have a futon like this <clears throat> because you gotta be able to relax half of painting is when you're not painting uh, half of painting is when you're sitting like this with your legs kind of crossed on your futon and you take the glasses off and you meditate on your painting. And you try to figure out, you might even not even be looking at that painting as you meditate. You might be looking at some other painting. <laughs> I mean, whatever is coming through your brain, but it's important because, you're, again, your subconscious as an artist, your subconscious is leading you somewhere with your painting. 
And you have to be in touch with that. You should be in touch, I should say. You don't have to be. And when you're in touch with that, it causes you to think of things that you might not ordinarily think of. And that's where you come up with what I call a genius move. Wow, that's a great idea. You tell yourself that. Wow. <laughs> you say to yourself, that's a great idea. Why did I think of that earlier? Because you weren't didn't open up that channel of understanding. You didn't open up that part of your brain. So it's very important to do something. And what I'm looking at now is the way my shadows is running across the, the characters and across the image uh, and across the canvas. We're, we're aware of the direction of the sun. Even though I have, it looks like a ray of sun behind them, bursting behind the fort. I also have my shadows going in a different direction. Why? Because I can do it. Nobody's going to notice it. It's the sky. And sometimes the sky does it. The sun's not really over there, but the way the terrain is laid out, it's light and it's reflecting a lot of light up into the clouds. And this when the sun is low in the horizon, it's really going a long way across the horizon. And sometimes, according to where the horizon is situated, you know, I got a fort in the middle of it and it's painting, and I got forest behind that, treetops, and maybe there's a mountain hills, who knows, some type of hills, and it's obscuring the sun, you can't see the sun, you just know that the sun is somewhere, you know that the light source is the sun, because they're outside, you know the sun is somewhere, and you assume the sun is in a certain place, but then again, some more information is telling you the sun might be somewhere else. <laughs> And what you're seeing is something else. And what is that something else? So those are little questions that I'm trying to, ambiguities, um, quirks, that, if you would, that goes against the grain a little bit. I think I need to bring some, now that I'm sitting, see now I just noticed something that I missed when I was all up close and into it. I need to bring some smoke above Wahan Sanoka's outreach arm. I need to bring some smoke above that. Uh, also, with Wahan Sanoka's plume that's on the spear, the little light, fuzzy uh, fur, I guess it's bird fur or whatever that is that that's made out of. I believe it's made out of a uh, type of pheasant, type of, of, of fowl, bird. Um, very fluffy. I need to bring that on the other side of his arm some more. Simply to just drag some of that light really around his whole hand to kind of accentuate his hand from the background. And uh, I can work on some more stuff with the smoke too that's around his waist area to accentuate some lights and darks and shadows there. And uh, But I need some above my hands and notice outstretched shoulder and arm. Kind of pop that away from that fort. It's just too that brown. It's too diagonal, too air, uh, too solid. So I'm going to break that up some. I am going to put some texture molds in that a little bit more, more or less. I don't know yet. Some more modeling in that. Um, and some smoke maybe underneath the sentry guy that's standing in the back a little bit. These are like the last wave of defense. And uh, you know he might get taken out by the arrowmen over on the other side, or one of those some other native that's coming. You know, natives live here. There's a finite group of guys in the fort. I think what there was a hundred guys, and they already done killed something. They, they died down to I don't know 20, 30. <laughs> this is a lot, and most of those are probably the women that's inside hunkering down. So I think they had women. I think there was a few women that came with them. Because I know there was a woman who kept, well, was basically the one in charge of feeding Matoaka, the person they called Pocahontas when she was in captivity. They had her in captivity down in Appomattox with Chesterfield, Virginia, somewhere around there, or Colonial Heights, in that area. And, um, it was a woman, basically, who was the person who was 
basically guarding her, you know, keeping her hostage, you know. She was just as guilty as the rest of them. So everybody was in on the plan. <laughs> uh, okay, so I just, right now, again, is this just where are these certain tones and shades are going to be? Put nose where they need to be placed. I'm gonna go ahead and just do the smoke on Hans and Elka first. Above him. I hope I didn't do titanium. I hope this is this is going down like titanium. What do we see? I want this to go down like zinc white, but it seems like it's going down that continuum. Maybe I have too much medium in it. I'm going to spread this smoke over some. And this is just going to cause his hair, his arm, to just pop it, and I'm going to go up to this level here, a little bit more. I don't need it to go everywhere. I just needed this to be enough, to pop enough of him to bring him forward. Okay. But I do need, I don't want to get one little patchy spot. I want to get kind of spread. It looks like it's smoke going wherever it will. The smoke is going to go wherever it will. Smoke is not going to stay in just one little spot, nice and tidy. Air is moving. The smoke is going to do its thing. The smoke just does what smoke does. Okay. Bring that up a little bit higher. Obscure some of this a little bit more. Also, in like manner, it's a great thing when you have so many brushes you don't know which one to use, but they all would do a different good job a different way. That's a great choice of creative options to have as opposed to working with too few brushes and not enough different kinds of brushes. What I'm going to do is just add a little bit more shadow again because it's not just the lights that define things, it's the shadow. So I'm going to start popping Mahan Sinoka a little bit more using some shadow. Using this uh, number uh, four filver, I just have it on the, on the side, and painting like sideways to the stroke to make that thinner line. Then what I'm doing is I'm building that line out into a shape after I make the line to separate it. And then I just blend this darker tone into these four pylons behind it. And I'm blending it so that it's going to be translucent. And you see the initial shape that I made underneath the translucent shadow. Then in the area of the trees, I'm going to just expand that line out the side. I'll just soft blending it. I'm going to go get some Viridian Green. Dapple it and mix it into that green. Get that the, a nice dark merge. 
and I start merging to the uh, forest behind it. Of that shadow effect, <coughs> the darkness of that. I have some texture where that is, and I rather much like that. So I don't. I'm accentuating that also with this viridian that I'm bringing into this dark color. Then I'm going to step back and see how that helped or not. But I believe it helped. Yeah, that did help. We come back.